Good evening. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we all meet and we learn from each other tonight on country. I'm coming to you from Gadigal land where I live, work and write, and I pay my sincere respects to elders past, present and emerging, and I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who may be with us here this evening. Good evening and welcome to another, I must say, the last episode of History Matters. My name is Rachel Franks and I'm the Coordinator of Scholarship at the State Library of New South Wales. And tonight I'm representing Richard Neville, the Mitchell Librarian, who really wanted to be here this evening, but unfortunately is unable to join us. It's been a great few years collaborating with the teams at Professional Historians Association of New South Wales and the ACT, and also our friends at the Oral History Association of New South Wales. For a few years now, we've brought you almost every month a fabulous panel of historians talking about the art and craft and the challenges of history. This evening, we have the same again, some great speakers for you tonight talking about digital and media histories. Your host this evening is Alana Piper. She'll be introducing our panelists and she'll also be taking your questions afterwards. So if you have any questions about what's being covered tonight, please just use the chat feature in Zoom. Alana is well known to many of you here this evening, I'm sure. She's a Chancellor's Postdoctoral Fellow at the Australian Centre for Public History at UTS. Thanks so much, Alana. Thank you, Rachel. I would also like to begin by paying my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, as well as any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples who may be viewing this session. I'm also talking to you from the land of Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, traditional owners of country whose sovereignty was never ceded, as well as custodians for knowledge in these lands. Let me extend my sincere thanks to Oral History New South Wales and the Professional Historians Association of New South Wales and the ACT for inviting me to chair what promises to be a most fascinating session on digital history. Digital history is a broad and growing field that encompasses the variety of ways that digital media can be used to conduct historical research, further historical analysis, or present histories to the public. Today, all of us probably make some use of digital spaces in our historical work, from searching on Trove to attending online seminars like this one. The recent pandemic has encouraged even greater reliance and more innovative uses of such technologies. However, our speakers tonight go beyond the types of technological uses that have become standard in historical practice. They engage with technology in creative ways that immerse their audiences in historical storytelling. And I am very much looking forward to hearing about their processes in shaping these digital worlds. It is therefore my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for the evening. Cellist Stephanie Arnold creates musical memory scapes combining interview material and oral history recordings with music performance and audio art. Tracing voices and histories through this form of musical storytelling, Stephanie's work focuses on the role of performance as a way to share stories while mindful of the ethics of interviewing, editing and collecting recorded stories. Welcome Stephanie. Thanks so much for having me um, speak today. Um, I'd also like to start by saying that I'm speaking to you from Larrakea country and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. just giving myself a second to present here on the screen. So we all are here today, um, I think because we want histories to live not just um, on shelves and in archives, but for a wider public to be able to engage with them in interesting ways. Um, and I'd like to talk about one of the ways I've been exploring this. 
um, thinking about how oral histories are performative. Uh, they're something that we do. Um, and so today I'll be talking about five of the musical and creative techniques I use in my projects to help audiences engage with oral history narratives in alternative ways. Um, and if there's time in the Q&A, um, I'd also love to talk about some of the benefits and challenges of these uh, creative approaches to history. So the four projects I'm going to be referring today are up on screen now. They are Across the Water, uh, which I made in collaboration with uh, composer Robert Davidson um, from Queensland, who specialises in speech melody, one of the techniques I'll be referring to later. And also in collaboration with the three interviewees who were refugees um, living on bridging visas in Melbourne. Uh, these tender threads was a work that I wrote um, with my piano trio where each of us interviewed our mother or grandmother about an aspect of memory loss. Song and Story was a collaboration with the musician that you see there, James Henry, and with three visual artists from Baluk Arts. Baluk Arts is an urban Aboriginal art centre um, based down on the Mornington Peninsula. Um, and finally, Happy to Chat was another uh, work that I made with my trio uh, and that used interviews with three Australian Uber drivers. Uh, so it was exploring their reactions to Uber's new feature of silent mode and it's interspersed with excerpts from the 1928 silent comedy, Speedy. So I want to start with this quote from Dennis Tedlock, who's a professor of English and anthropology um, and is known for his poetic treatment of oral history transcripts. And he says, an oral story is not an object of art or any other kind of object. It's an action. It's something I do. It's an action that's now and that speaks of ancient things. The story is what I'm telling you now with my own breath and with my own body. So performance can have many different definitions and contexts, but the one I want to focus on um, in terms of oral history um, performance is performance as an execution of an action, as, as Tetlock describes. So I'm interested in the option or this option for revisiting oral histories through performance art and through acting out the interview again in some way. And in doing so, asking the audience to be active participants themselves. So to become listeners and to imagine sharing the space of the original interview. And even though we do have access now to a range of different technologies um, to capture video and sound, it can still be challenging to find an accessible way to share the experience of actually being in the room, that feeling of being in the room with the storyteller's own breath and own body as, as Tetlock again describes. So I want to explore the reasons why I think performance art allows for this space of liveness or this sense of liveness to be recreated. Um, and I think that's because in a performance space, you can create a new tension and atmosphere. And I think it's this that allows for deep listening and imaginative thinking. So another professor of history well regarded for his focus on performative aspects of oral history and nuances of sound within interviews is Charles Hardy. And he says oral histories, as we all know, are performative and each person's vocalisations, language, accent, intonation, sonority, cadence, tonality, vocabulary, the whole complex symphony of verbal expression is living history and, and historical artefact. Um, and I've also included here uh, a quote from the well-known Italian oral historian Alessandro Portelli who says the tone and volume range and the rhythm of popular speech carry implicit meaning and social connotations which are not reproducible in writing. So I think these quotes capture two themes that are central to my projects. This sense of liveness that I've been talking about in relation to choosing performance art as a medium to share oral history and attention to meaning achieved by a deeper listening and awareness of the nuance of spoken word. So in my work, I use compositional and musical techniques to draw attention to what 
Charles Hardy describes as the whole complex symphony of verbal expression. And I love how in these two quotes that actually the language is so musical, it just reinforces how much music there is uh, when we are communicating. I also include the nonverbal, the pauses, the silences, which are also so important. Um, and I do this through the use of uh, editing and repetition, speech melody, musical imagery or word painting, light motif, and including visuals. So let's go through some of those techniques in more detail. So when I work on my projects, I see the editing process as a tool to understanding and analysis. And after completing each interview, I listen to the whole interview again in full, and I stop um, and mark sort of different times when something stands out. And so this first re-listening is an important part of the process for me because it's the first time that I've re-experienced what's happened in the interview. Um, and it's so interesting to notice how much you don't remember or misremember or realise that you were distracted by something else, whether that's about the interviewee themselves or the space that you're in. Uh, and then I follow up with uh, another listening where I'm stopping when something stands out. It could be a word or a sentence. And that's when I start the editing process. So when I'm uh, cutting uh, the interview up and starting to loop. And here I begin to really listen because I'm listening to the repetition and I'm looking for the intention expressed in the rhythm or change of pitch, um, emphasis, might be a clap of a hand, the sound of a gesture to help to emphasise a point. So in the works themselves, repetitions used to give the listener another chance to listen out for meaning they didn't quite grasp or a word or a sentence that escapes them in the performance. And this gives the audience some of the same experience that I have when I re-listen. So the idea of, of being made aware of what you might have missed. Um, there are also studies, I find this so interesting, there are studies that show how repetition makes the listener feel like they're participating. And this is why we, our brains are, are so keen when we hear repetition in music. So what happens is our brains begin to anticipate what's being repeated and it carves out familiar and rewarding paths in our minds. So we're starting to imagine or anticipate what's happening and then we feel like we're part or more part of that experience. So repetition is also something that I use in combination with the technique of speech melody. So uh, speech melody, uh, which I want to give you an example of now, is where the music mirrors the role played by pitch, rhythm, sentence stress, emphasis, pauses, hesitations of recorded speech. So the music played with the voice shows the listener the changes in pitch, length, accent on parts of the words, and in doing so highlights the emotional meaning behind them. So in this example, you're going to hear the text itself, the speech melody, and then both of them together. I decide to go to Australia. So to go further into the meaning behind the words themselves, the second uh, the next technique that I'm going to show you um, is word painting or tone painting, or sometimes also referred to as musical imagery. So this is where you compose music that calls to mind the literal meaning of the lyrics or the text. And in this example, you hear the glissandi, which are the slides. Um, of the finger on the string um, by the strings and this represents a feeling of um, instability. You'll also hear overlapping edits which are then mirrored by the instruments suggesting a feeling of confusion and paranoia and in this example you might also notice some speech melody and repetition. Oh let's try that again. <laughs> 
So next we come to something called leitmotif, which is a recurring short musical phrase uh, connected with a specific person, place or idea. And this is often used or was often used in operas or is now still um, to signify important people, places or themes and to unite disparate elements throughout a work or series of work. So basically to help the audience keep track. Um, and my approach here is a slightly broader one. So I didn't restrict myself necessarily to the short motive or theme, um, but I did want to assign specific music to each voice. So with this particular project, uh, which was Song and Story down on the peninsula, we performed in an art gallery and the three artists that I'd interviewed, their works were surrounding the audience. And they each had two movements that were played at different times through the, through the performance. And I wanted to be able to give the audience something to hold on to, to imagine that person had walked into the space. Sometimes they were in the space as well, but I wanted to give this oral cue to then by their music coming in first and then their interview um, following. So when I play this example, I'm just going to jump forward a bit through it. It's just a bit long and I want to be able to share each of the artists. Um, so I'll show you that now. I guess most of the work I make is um, centred around themes of identity, of protection, of nurture. of identity reclaiming I guess the past I sort of it's, it's a bit like I yearn for the past instrumentation or own flow, tempo, rhythm um, and different keys as well. So the final technique that I want to mention is using visuals and this is something that while I have incorporated an aspect of that through all my projects is always developing. Uh, so for example the, the picture you have on your screen is the excerpt of uh, Speedy, um, the silent comedy for Happy to Chat. Um, and when the Uber drivers uh, were speaking, that just went to a black screen with the text on the wall. Um, the other example that I want to show you of this is again from Across the Water. Um, and that's because when we initially were talking about putting text in, we actually found it difficult to decide whether to do that or not. Um, we really wanted the audience to make listening its focus. Um, but in the end, we felt that we wanted to make it accessible and that was more important. Um, but through the, the presentation, if there are some things repeated, we have left the text away at times and we've chosen to um, bold some of the text as, as you'll see now. Pitching visa is like 
living constantly on a loose bridge? Pitching visa is like living constantly on a loose bridge and you cannot go back, you cannot go further, and you don't know what to do. We don't have. So, through implementing all of these uh, techniques, I continuously refer back to the initial interviews and try to stay true to the mood and character that's being expressed. I'm trying to imagine that person in the space that I work. Just before I wrap up, um, I want to say that one of the reasons that I was inspired to start exploring or making oral history based on this performance art came about after hearing of the kinds of interdisciplinary projects that were happening at the oral history department um, at Concordia University, led by such people as uh, Professor Stephen High. And I wanted to leave you with a quote uh, from the book Going Public, The Art of Participatory Practice. Um, and this is by uh, documentary maker Elizabeth Miller, theatre maker Edward Little and Professor Stephen High. So I think that the quote gives a reason uh, for why, um, like I said, all of us here have that interest in, in the wider public uh, being able to engage in different ways with history. Stephen High says, history making and representations are societal rather than simply a disciplinary project that going public with knowledge and art can spur democratic processes by challenging us to rethink our assumptions. So I'll end it there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie, for sharing that really moving work. I think a lot of the issues that you raised in your talk are actually going to have great strong links uh, with the work of our next speaker as well, which should make for a really interesting discussion later. So I now welcome our second speaker for this evening. Uh, Noelle Janicheska is a playwright, poet, essayist, and the author of the book of Thistles by UWA Publishing. Noelle is the recipient of multiple awards, including the 2020 New South Wales Premier's Digital History Prize for her work on the episode Experiment Street uh, for the podcast The History Listen. Her poetry collection, Scratchland, uh, came out in 2020 as well, so it was a, a big year for Noelle. Uh, welcome, Noelle, now. Thank you, Alana, and thanks, Stephanie. That was great. Um, thanks everybody. I'm also speaking from um, Gadigal country, um, land that was never ceded. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and in the wind. I've written for broadcasting community radio, audio scripts for museum exhibitions, for multimedia projects and other platforms. And I've recently begun work on a new project which will combine audio and live performance, drama, nonfiction, and works which are a synthesis of both. This evening, I'm going to talk about two works which deal with historical subject matter and inquiry and which bring a performative approach to the material. Experiment Street was commissioned by ABC Radio National's The History Listen and was first broadcast in October 2019. It was researched, written and co-produced by myself with producer Ros Blewett and sound designer Russell Stapleton. I'm going to play the first couple of minutes of it. You can download the whole piece from the ABC RN website if you're interested. to show my screen. Okay. Experiment Street is a small nondescript back lane on Gadigal country in Piermont, an inner city suburb I think of as one of the old storied parts of Sydney. Its name intrigued me and of course a name demands stories to anchor it in place. As you can see from these images, Experiment Street today is a narrow thoroughfare of back ends, rear entrances and parked cars. The past crowded out by the present, or so it seems initially. Come dusk, 
it gets a bit film noir. Twenty sixth of March, nineteen hundred. Dear Sir, I apply to you to inform you of a state of things which often. Sorry. Sorry about that. Twenty sixth of March, nineteen hundred. Dear Sir, I apply to you to inform you of a state of things which often exists in the lane, or street, as it's called, Experiment Street. Will you please send the men to fumigate my place, as the children are better of the scarlet fever. H grade, 64 Experiment Street. Three youths were before the Central Police Court this morning charged with riotous behaviour. They were kicking a ball about Experiment Street and annoying people in the congregational church. During a fight in a house in Experiment Street, Andrew Norwood, known in the locality as Strong Andrew, was seriously stabbed. I remember that incident. Last Saturday of November, 1920. Blood gushing everywhere. In the city of Sydney archives, there are boxes of minutes from long ago council meetings. Faded ink, paper the colour of milky coffee, a lot of correspondence about drains and such like. Songs of the Sydney Slums, Christmas Eve in Experiment Street by Coralie Stanley McKellar, published 1921. Mary worked in a grocery store in Experiment Street, Piemont. John was a carter in the Darling Harbour forwarding station. Mary and John were to be married at the new year. John's little 17-year-old sister Flo, a bad little girl. Christmas Eve in Experiment Street is fiction but it's grounded in fact, same as myself. I'm not on the official record, but still, I could have been plenty like me in Experiment Street. Think of me as a patchwork character. Historian Daniel K. Richter discusses layered pasts, a geology of different cultural scenes where earlier strata remain beneath the surface to sculpt the contours of the present. When you walk down Experiment Street, and when you take your time, you notice the patterns of the past, traces that remain in names, in remnants of Art Deco architecture, in the weed species that sprout in cracks between bricks and paving stones. The history of Experiment Street exists in neighborhood folklore, and in stories like that of Joyce Howe, her Indian fiance Fazil Saad, and their 1931 wedding that never was. Experiment Street uses the audio medium, sound effects, rhythm, musicality, different registers of language and forms of address to reveal those layers and forgotten episodes. Experiment Street began as a poetry project. I created three female voices and had them living and lodging in Experiment Street around the time of the 1917 strike. That was the original plan. Much of my writing across performance, audio and print draws on extensive research, be it fieldwork, reading or archival truffling. To gather background of context for this poetry collection, I trawled state archives, the State Library, Trove, and at the City of Sydney archives, I waded through boxes of files of long ago council meetings, surveyors maps and correspondence focused on matters of drainage, lighting and such like. At a certain point in the research process, actually quite early on, I realised I wanted to make use more of the archival material I'd found and use it more fully, more explicitly. So I decided to write Experiment Street as an audio script. <laughs> 
The first mention of Experiment Street I dug up was this road construction plan from 1881. I'm interested in the stories and experiences of women, of migrants, of the marginalised, those whose perspectives are largely missing from our national narratives, people whose voices we rarely hear, the smudged spaces of history. I'm a performance writer, whether I'm composing poetry or prose, scripting theatre or audio. My approach to history is to use my dramatist skills to animate the archival record and evoke an era. To that end, I created what I call a fiction based in fact character, Lizzie Absalom, widow, seamstress, and as a fictional entity, a woman able to skip across time. Guided by Lizzie Absalom, Experiment Street tells the story of this lane from its origin as a line of workers' terraces in the early 1880s to demolition as part of the city's slum clearance driver. From the warehouses and manufacturing plants that replaced those individual houses in the 1930s to the freeways and apartment blocks of today. And it tells that history through the interplay of voices, the voices of those who lived, worked, and hung out in Experiment Street. Scripted lines, with the exception of those uttered by Lizzie Absalom, are all drawn directly from the historical record, archival documents and letters, official reports, and newspaper accounts. How do you deal with gaps and absences in official records? What the American historian Saidea Hartman calls the silence in the archives. She writes about making speculative arguments, about pushing back against the confines of history in order to imagine what cannot be verified through the usual means and sources. See, she suggests it requires new forms. Also commissioned by ABC RN's A History Lesson, Mrs. C, Private Detective, is a work that is currently in production. It's a portrait of the life and casebook of Kate Condon, a female private investigator who operated in Brisbane in the early decades of the 20th century. The piece is narrated by Mrs. C, a not always entirely reliable witness to her own life. Like Lizzie Absalom in Experiment Street, Mrs. C is a composite drawn from research character. In this instance, however, I've created a semi-fictionalized version of a real person. As often happens with me, I came across Kate Condon when I was researching another project, and I've decided to follow the advice of Robert Danton, who wrote this in his 1984 book. I have pursued what seemed to be the richest run of documents, following leads wherever they went and quickening my pace as soon as I stumbled on a surprise. Straying from the beaten paths may not be much of a methodology, but it creates the possibility of enjoying some unusual views, and they can be the most revealing. Biographical information about Kate Condon is sketchy, and what exists is laced with ambiguity and contradiction, and Kate herself played an active part in this obfuscation. Most of the information about her is found in reports of court proceedings, and even there, even under cross-examination in the witness box, she gives differing and inconsistent accounts of her personal and family history. Instead of bemoaning this, I decided to use it as a way of organising the material and cast Mrs C as the piece's unreliable narrator, drawing on her own words and mixing them with some fiction inspired by research, dramatic licence. Again, scripted lines, aside from some of those spoken by Mrs. C, are drawn directly from historical records. The flowering of the detective story in the 1920s and 30s introduced us to country house murders and the hard-boiled streets of urban America, to private eyes. Go back further to the end of the 19th century and the lady detective was a familiar figure in fiction. Usually a woman of genteel background who took up sleuthing because there was no male provider on the scene. 
information about the actual women employed as inquiry agents paints a rather different picture. Most were working or lower middle class with children to support, like Kate Condon, who was a mother of 10. Despite a burgeoning literature about fictional female detectives, the real woman detective remains a somewhat shadowy figure. Kate's exploits made newspaper headlines, but what was the reality of being a Lady D in the early 20th century? Much of her work involved nabbing unfaithful spouses in compromising circumstances, the kind of proof required before we had no-fault divorce laws. After ascertaining where the lovers' trysts were taking place, Kate would typically hide under the veranda, armed with her trusty electric torch. Then, choosing her moment, she would appear at the bedroom window, switch on her torch and flash the hapless couple caught misconducting for all to see. When I write an audio script, I include not only commentary, dialogue and narration, not only spoken words, but I also write the words, the work soundscape, a wide circumference of possible sound effects, archival footage, music suggestions, hesitations and silences. That's a large part of the appeal audio as a medium and as a platform for historical exploration holds for me. And in certain respects, it's not unlike poetry because it involves distilling the material, not just once, but again and again, until you arrive at what I like to think of as its crystalline form. That's it for me, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Noel. That was, again, a really interesting insight into your uh, work and, yeah, great connections between uh, both of our speakers' works. So I'd invite uh, both Noel and Stephanie now to unmute and uh, turn on their cameras and we can start our panel discussion. Right. Uh, so, yes, so it's a question at time now. So I'd invite any of the audience members, if you've got questions, to pop those into the chat and I will get started straight away with those. So the first question I think that a lot of people will have is the sort of you know, point of connection between both your works is creating these uh, wonderful sort of creative soundscapes that immerse people uh, into history in a very sort of tangible way. And so I was wanting to take that as the sort of starting point for the discussion and ask you both uh, whether you think sound as a medium has particular qualities and virtues uh, in terms of immersing people in a sense of the past, um, you know, why you think it's particularly effective. And also, you know, as a counter to that, what are the particular challenges of working with this medium? Um, well, I don't mind say something. Um, yes, I think it. I think it is very good at drawing people in. Um, I think because you're not dealing with the visual, you're just dealing with what you are listening to. Um, that creates a kind of. It has a distilling effect, um, which can be really good. Um, I think it also requires us to use our imaginations. We seem to live in a culture where everything is often so spelt out. Um, there's not a lot of room for sort of um, letting our imagination flow. And I think that's something that listening to something that's audio does. You're you constantly have pictures um, in your mind. You're imagining things. You're sort of seeing the story in your mind's eye as you listen to it. Um, so, yes, I think there are qualities about audio that, that work really well to immerse a listener, to immerse an audience. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with, with all of that. I think in terms of, of connecting to the past as well, sounds can be so emotive, like they can really tap into to how we're feeling um, in a way that I think is pretty unique and special. Um, and I think that thing about being enveloped by sound too is, is something that, like uh, we've talked about, both of us in different ways, um, it is all encompassing or almost embodying like you can feel feel that um 
very keenly. I think this this question about listening to and sound is interesting because when when we're in tune and listening carefully, we're blocking out other um, distractions, hopefully. And by doing that can really narrow in, um, like, uh, like Noelle mentioned, crystallize or um, I often think there's a Georgia O'Keeffe quote and she says it's only by selection, elimination and emphasis that we can get to the true reality of something. And I think that's something that's helped, helped by sound, by blocking everything else out so you can really focus. I think it also allows for polyvocality, um, audio, um, that you can actually, it's a really easy way to have, um, to have multiple voices in there that if you're doing something on a page it is harder to do whereas you immediately you're immediately hearing multiple voices when she went in audio yes and i thought that sort of links with the point that you made really nicely about the power of sort of creative tellings of history to fill in the gaps and the silences that the archives leave um the sort of you know second part of that that question was about the sort of challenges of working with this medium? Did um, either of you have uh, particular uh, yeah. hurdles that you've encountered that you feel uh, safe sharing? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There are definitely challenges. I mean, some are technical. Um, so actually for something that I was reflecting on when I was putting together the presentation was in Song and Story during one of the interviews uh, with one of the artists. Uh, they were in a, in a room that had a beautiful tin roof and saying wonderful things in a massive um, downpouring of rain sort of interrupted several times. Um, and yeah, I guess in a sense, that's just what happened. And I don't want to not ca capture that as well, but um, it's difficult obviously to uh, control what's happening um, sound wise around you. I think the other point I want to make about some of the challenges with sound are to do with who you're interviewing. And so for um, Across the Water, one of the things that quickly came up for me was that uh, some of my participants didn't want to be recognised. They didn't want their voices recognised. Um, and so uh, that was a huge challenge. We had to think about ways to hide their voices um, and, and sort of thought about how, how to show or share um, everything that's still interesting about their voices and, and the meaning of the words that they were saying um, while their voices were disguised. And the feedback from, from those performances were, were quite interesting um, because the timbre of the voice was often mistaken for something else. And I think that's a really interesting space to sort of think about um, when sound is used to represent someone and how to be careful and ethical around that. I th yeah, I, th I think some of the, I agree, some of the, um, some of the challenges are definitely the technical challenges um, of putting this together. I think in my case, I also think some of them are, most of the audio work I've done has been for a the ABC, not all of it, but a lot of it. And that's, the programs have very particular requirements and demands, so there are constraints. And sometimes constraints are good, and sometimes they're limiting in ways you don't really want them to be limiting. Yes, uh, you know, I think the ethics um, of, of the space of digital, because it is, you know, a, a new world or, a, you know, podcasting is, you know, comparatively new medium, uh, you know, opens up ethical questions as much as technical ones. Uh, but on the sort of technical side of things, we do have a question from the audience asking, you know, what are the programs and applications that you're both making use of in your work? Um, are you doing it yourself or are you getting help with those technical side of things? And, you know, how long does it really take for a program um, or your outputs to be made? from sort of, you know, starting to interview to final cut? Yeah, so uh, the programs that I'm using have actually varied uh, through the years that I've been making making the project. So initially I just started out with GarageBand. Um, I had a, a really nice Zoom recorder, which was useful to do the initial interviews, but then all the music side of things I was basically just doing with my instrument and my laptop, a simple mic, 
Um, and then over the different projects, that's developed a lot further. Um, so, and actually change depending on the circumstances of the project too. So for example, in Happy to Chat, most of the interviews that I did with my Uber drivers were in the car. So it was really awkward to pull out a Zoom recorder and, and sort of get organized for good quality sound. So I often just recorded on my phone um, and then would um, edit, like do post-production on, on the interview um, afterwards. Uh, and then uh, as it's developed too, I've gone through different um, digital audio workstations. So now I'm, I'm using Ableton a lot more mainly because uh, it allows me to be freer in terms of what I'm doing through performance and, and with the edited material. Um, so that's always um, developing. Uh, yeah, and then uh, the other part of the question, sorry, was... Uh, so it's it basically, yeah, what sort of program uh, how applications long, yeah. and how long does it take, yeah. Yeah, so the length for a project, um, isn't just uh, sort of dictated by by that sound production time. Um, I'd say depending on the number of interviews that I'd need sort of a month to do the very hardcore technical editing detail stuff at the end. But the process for getting the interviews and to do all the work to sit down with the participants and show them the edits and reflect on them and just do all the work in the lead up to even get the interviews in the first place is where the time exists. Um, so for every project I've done, uh, the estimate that I've had for how long that might take um, has always been too short, even after <laughs> having some experience with longer ones. So I think um, this idea, I think it's important or I'm learning that um, you need to trust the interviewees and the relationships that you have with them and the journey that you're going on um, as being essential and part of that um, process. And that's been difficult in some circumstances where there have been festival deadlines or things like that. Um, but I've, I've always pushed for for the process to come first. So even if that means going to the festival and saying, look, I don't think we're going to be ready by that time um, or changing of what, what that outcome is, um, I think it's more important than pushing in any way that initial um, process, which is to really sit down and ethically and intentionally capture those stories. I um, I'm a writer. I'm not a a sound technician at all so I don't I, I have sometimes had to take the recorder and go and interview someone but it's absolutely not my favorite thing or my particular skill set I spend all my time worrying about I'm going to have made all this trek out and come back with something that hasn't actually recorded um, so I try to avoid that and I've been the works I've done in audio have either been um, commissioned mostly by the ABC or the BBC or have um, been for um, production companies where they've been doing their own audio works for um, museums and um, online and multimedia context, the shopping domes. So I, that hasn't been part of my remit. I've done the research, um, come up with the idea, the writing, um, the scripting, um, conducted the interviews, integrated you know the interviews in and then I work if there are actors involved then I'm often um, directing or co-directing the actors as well in their lines and um, then I work with the producer together and the, with the sound engineer together putting things together trying things listening to how they work together um, which is always really exciting how something comes together and the surprises you find once you start putting things together um, that's always really good and it takes a I think it takes a long time. It's a, it, it's a bit like how long is a piece of string? From the initial idea of kind of coming up with, say, Mrs. C, Private Detective, when I first came up with that idea, to now it's in production at the moment and will probably go to air, be broadcast early next year. Um, it's probably been about 18 months, but it isn't the only thing I've worked on over that time. And obviously COVID, actually, in the case of Mrs. C, Private Detective, got in the way and I, a trip to Brisbane was cancelled because everything went into lockdown. But yeah, it, it takes time and it's different from project to project. There's no one 
time frame. Um, once I'd finished the script, it's now moved into production really, really fast, which is unusual because the wheels of the ABC usually to turn fairly slowly. But in this case, uh, that's not proven to be the case, but it, it varies hugely and depends on the project. Mm. So moving on from those uh, technical questions about, you know, what sort of programs you use, and we're having a lot of interest coming through and different sort of questions uh, around, you know, people who are interested in engaging in this area themselves um, and perhaps uh, telling stories about the histories that they're researching in more creative or performative ways and wanting to know if you have uh, suggestions for resources that they can check of you know how to do that in effective ways or uh, recommendations of people who you perhaps uh, draw inspiration uh, from who have you know written about these processes um i think for me in terms of recommendations for things that have inspired sort of where I first went when I was interested in, in creating these projects was really uh, the Concordia, things that were happening in Concordia in, in Montreal. Um, so their Centre for Oral History and Digital Storytelling has some really great resources um, on ethics and on digital storytelling, um, which, which I found really useful. Um, the rest of it, I mean, so many different um, organizations online have helped me too, uh, here in Australia too, Oral History Victoria and um, the various state libraries and national libraries have amazing archives with so much rich material. I think the challenge is making sure um, that whatever you're working with, that you have uh, permission um, to, to use it in the way that you want to use it. Um, and so through my projects, um, I've been lucky in the sense that I've mostly worked with stories from people that I can directly talk to and sit down with when I'm editing their material. Um, I'm really interested also in using archival sounds and, and material, um, but I think that there's just um, a lot more time needed to make sure that uh, whatever material you're working with, you know um, exactly how you can treat that. Um, with sound and, and in terms of editing, especially. Um, so, so that would be my tips. But I think the other thing is just to really, to speak to people and go and try things out and say, this is the kind of thing that I'm sort of imagining. What do you think? And what would you suggest? And, and those institutions um, I'm sure would be really excited to, to hear that someone's using their material or wants to use it in that sort of creative way. You know, I would say the same thing about there's a lot of there's rich material in archives, not just state archives, but but specialist ones, police archives. I found the city of Sydney archives was masses of material I could have carried on making programs from that archive forever. There was so much interesting stuff and inevitably when you're looking through one thing, you keep finding other things that you sort of want to send you off on all these um, tangents. Um, I think my other advice would be to kind of to listen to find podcasts or audio works that you like and listen to a lot as many. I mean, there's a whole range of things from like, you know, two people chatting or a, a sort of monologue piece to things that are really sophisticated audio works. Um, I can't off the top of my head come up with things that are about the audio specifically. I think I read I read historians, so I would recommend reading historiography. Um, people like Sadia Hartman's fantastic um, about exactly what isn't in archives, whose stories get recorded, how you deal with that, how you write, how you put those voices into history that have been marginalized or left out. Um, and I guess that sort of inspired my interest rather than specifically about audio per se. I mean, there's also an organisation, I think, called Audiocraft, um, which is in Australia that brings together a whole lot of people who make podcasts, producers, makers, people. So that might be a good place to, um, to go to look up Audiocraft and get on their mailing list. Yeah, uh, given that, Noelle, you've just uh, mentioned that, you know, you take 
inspiration often from reading the work of historians, I might uh, flick to a question that's about sort of disciplinary divides and gatekeeping between historians and other production media types asking um, where you think that there's sort of a gatekeeping or, or disciplinary divide that happens between historians and um, people who sort of work in uh, media and art to tell historical stories um, and how you think this sort of impacts uh, how you go about producing digital histories? Look, that's a complex area. And, you know, I think every discipline, every art form, every theatre company or publisher, every, there are gatekeepers everywhere, unfortunately. Um, I think I'm really interested in, in hybridity and in sy synthesising things. So I'm really interested in um, using historical material, but not just in you know, writing article or something, but in um, ways that bring it to life and in ways that still honour the people who lived, the, the honour the past and the people who lived in it or respect that. That doesn't mean that you avoid difficult subject matter or asking tricky questions. Um, but I also think that, I don't think there are any hard, I don't think there are hard and fast rules about, for me about it. Um, I think each project has its own ethical, in disciplinary constraints and possibilities. But I also think that's often where innovation happens. It often happens where one discipline meets another. And in the, that kind of overlap there, that's often a space of innovation. And that interests me. Um, and I think it probably varies. I and mean, probably some historians are, interested in interdisciplinary work themselves or in collaborating with people in other art forms and some perhaps less so um, and the same with artists with, as a writer I really like collaborating with other people um, and because I'm mostly a, I've been mostly a theatre and audio writer that's an inherently collaborative mm. art form you can't put on a theatre production on your own um, so I think each discipline has its kind of has its constraint has its boundaries has its people who police the boundaries. But uh, I think the interesting space is often where, where disciplines bump up against each other and overlap. Yeah, we're almost out of time. So I might uh, just ask one sort of final question to you both. I'm sorry to those audience members who um, questions we haven't got to, but there was just so many there. Uh, so final question and I'll direct it to Stephanie uh, first. You know, how do you think uh, digital histories or uh, sort of creative histories uh, that you're creating uh, shaping or changing public conversations about the past? And, and how would you like to see those conversations about the past being changed by your work? So I think what I'm really interested in is finding ways to connect these histories with people um, that are maybe a little bit more unexpected. Um, and I think, um, I think oral history has been um, sort of, it's all about, you know, or came from that idea that some histories or perspectives weren't being shared or heard. Um, and I think, that idea that we can um, sort of go through those archives or find those people and encourage them to have interviews and connect with them and share their stories in some way, um, especially when it's with them as well. <laughs> so with their involvement, if they're um, around and alive, um, can just be a really great form of acknowledgement of those stories and, and I think to make a broader public aware that these stories are part of their story I think is is just really powerful and like you know that Stephen High quote said can spur sort of those democratic processes a little bit more by bringing people together out in public to to acknowledge them um yeah yeah though I'd agree with everything Daphne says I think it's about wanting to provide um, access to people so people can access some of those stories and a bigger range of stories not just say the important white men of history but a whole range of other people and voices and perspectives that they might not be so familiar with um, so I think it's about communicating that it's about saying that 
there are there are a lot of those gaps and absences and silences in our history um, that are interesting to look into, um, interesting to explore, and perhaps politically and socially and culturally really important to acknowledge. Fantastic. And yes, you're both doing incredible work in this space and in opening up these conversations about our past. Uh, so with that, I would invite everyone to join me in thanking our speakers for a fascinating conversation this evening. I'd also like to thank Oral History New South Wales and the Professional Historians Association of New South Wales and the ACT, not only for organising uh, tonight's uh, seminar, but in fact an, an entire wonderful series across this year. I'd also thank, like to thank you, our audience, for joining us here tonight. Uh, we will now release you to continue enjoying the rest of your evening. Goodbye and thanks.